I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Called to Coach, recorded on November 22nd, 2022. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live and you don't see the YouTube chat room, there's a link right above me to it. You click on that. We'd love your questions during the program. If you're listening after the fact, you can send us your questions, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Call the Coach on your favorite podcast app or right there on YouTube so you never miss an episode. Jeremy Petrosini is our host today. Is our host today. Jeremy works as a senior workplace consultant with Gallup. And Jeremy, great to have you on location. Great to have you. Welcome back to Call the Coach. Coach yeah, you too, man. I, we were just joking. If, if we're talking about authentic leadership, I guess an authentic work, virtual work environment from a lobby of a random hotel in Greenville, South Carolina. Well, we are going to give it our best attempts to make this work today. And Jeremy, I want to recognize you nine and a half years ago. You helped me kick off what is today yes. called the coach. Hard to believe we're coming up on our 10th anniversary here in July. But you sat with me as we pioneered this program nine and a half years ago and got it all kicked off. And then I haven't had you back no. since then. Yeah, yeah. It was we. Uh, yeah, we kind of we we awkwardly wiggled our way through some of those early early episodes with guests man but yeah it's fun fun to just uh to see it come come to light so for jeremy for those who don't know let's get this kicked off and get this started tell us a little bit about what does gallup pay you to do and give us your top five yeah you bet so i'm a senior workplace consultant been with gallup uh 17 years so I uh, spend most of my weeks traveling, hence being in Greenville, South Carolina today. But most uh, days I'm on site with clients, either advising around data, uh, doing courses around management, leadership, uh, strengths, engagement. And then uh, I get to have the fun opportunity to, to speak at a lot of big events. So um, my top five, maximizer, strategic, futuristic, belief, and connectedness. So get the chance to uh to use those day in day in day out with with what I get paid to do. Yeah, we'll have to work a little bit harder getting you back on on a more regular basis. Your schedule's pretty tight, so it's hard to to get you on a regular basis. So you're in the lobby of a hotel today and so we we appreciate you coming back today to talk about authentic leadership. And I think this is a phrase as we've made our way through the pandemic, you know, uh, we've gone through this idea of quiet quitting as well. There's been all these kinds of management crises that we thought about. Uh, we wrote the book, It's the Manager, a couple of years ago. So we spent a ton of time thinking about managing. We have the new Clifton Strengths for Leaders report that just came out earlier in the month. Here at Gallup, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about leaders. And when we think about authentic leaders, although that takes on kind of a different nuance. Can you, can you talk about that from, from your perspective, Jeremy, just so folks know you work with leaders a lot. And so the opportunity, you have the opportunity to do what we're seeing and how do we think about this idea of authentic leadership? What, what, what do we really mean when we say that? Yeah. So, I, I mean, if they did if people didn't have the chance to go back and listen, I know there's some previous sessions we just did around this leadership report. So, Therese has some great insights um, around leaders when we're coaching leaders. Uh, do they feel like they can be themselves with us as coaches versus sometimes do they feel like they need to play a role? And you hear it a lot. I know there's other assessments out there separate from Clifton Strengths that even talk about your adaptive self, who you are, you know, at work versus at home. And when people actually ask about, you know, do my strengths change? What does that look like? Again, we got tons of data on that. But I think one of the things that's so powerful is when you think of that word authentic, um, it just means genuine. So if I'm in Hong Kong for work and want to buy my wife a bag, if it says to me on it or it says <laughs> Louis Vuitton on it, I, I want to figure out, is it authentic, right? Is it, if I'm buying it off the street, is it the real thing um, or not? And I think this is something, uh, Bill George even, even authored a book years ago called Authentic Leadership and then a follow-up on that called True North where he talks about this whole idea of, of finding your true north. Who are you? Who are you called to be? Who are you destined to be? Give yourself permission to be yourself. Um, and I know we've talked in the past, uh, uh, Jim, pl 
plenty of times. I know we've had my my coach even before I joined Gallup 17 years ago, uh, Michael Daphne, who wrote a book. One of the chapters or sections is on permission, and I think that's a big part of what being an authentic leader is: is giving yourself permission to be you. So play to your strengths, not somebody else's. Uh, I, Dr. Clifton, you know, one of his famous phrases, and I, some people don't like it, <laughs> his favorite, favorite quotes, is that people don't change that much. And then he went on to say, so don't waste time trying to put in what was left out, but spend more time trying to pull out what's already there. So it's where a leader who has woo in their bottom five and says, hey, can you help me to be more outgoing? There's things we can work on, but I often will say, nope, trying to move, trying to move uh, woo from 29 up or wherever it's at. Uh, one of my colleagues or one of our colleagues actually calls that foo. So that's fake woo. <laughs> They're like, you will show up to the party with a few tips and tricks on how to win friends and influence people, but it will still be awkward for you and <laughs> others. So be your true self, like yeah. be the relator, the learner, whoever it is that you are. One of the things I always talk about, and by the way, thanks to the chat room, they let me know I was on the wrong microphone. I've been on the uh, camera mic you, here. You just got really clear, man. It yeah, you, you, well, Jeremy, you could have told me a little bit earlier. Like, I didn't you, know. That was all I did. talking for the that last 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Paul, or uh, Steve, thanks for getting me on the right mic. Um, hopefully it didn't, wasn't too painful to your ears. One of the things that we think about authentic leadership is it's hard to maintain an act for a long period of time, yep. right? And so if you're, as you're leading people, if you're trying to be someone you're not, or you're trying to provide um, uh, leaderships beyond the strengths that you, that you have, I think that can only last so long. And then eventually you kind of, you run out of track, right? I mean, yeah. you, you get to some point where you're discovered <laughs> and people are like, oh, hey, can you talk a little bit about that as you work with leaders? Maybe this idea of bringing your whole self or as we really, we look at our, uh, we look at our strengths really focusing on those as opposed to trying to fake it. Yeah. And I think that I, I like the phrase whole self. I mean, uh, our most recent body of work uh, from Gallup is well-being at work. And even back where we used to separate personal life, professional life, people use the phrase work-life balance. And you're like, how do you balance those things? And for decades, we've actually been saying healthy workplace cultures. It's more work-life integration. My boss knows my family is important to me. And so he'll, he'll, Forced me to take that time off and some other things that that he knows I really want, um, and my family knows work's important, so um, they're fine with me finding a spot in a lobby of a hotel to to do a call to coach. So um, that that whole piece of again finding yourself or being true to yourself, bringing your whole self to work. The other language I really like, and again I know this goes back to Dr. Clifton's early early research. Um, when he was studying excellence in individuals and, and teams and, and organizations is he would often just say, how do you, how do you live your, your best self or become your best self? And that whole idea, again, of pulling out what's already there, I think for, for too many of us, and by the way, we see this in professional athletes and professional musicians. I don't think, I don't know Michael Phelps, you know, the world's fastest swimmer and most winning swimmer. I don't know him personally, but I don't think in fifth grade, his parents said, you're great at swimming, now test out of that and focus on all these other things. I think what they did is said, you're really good at this, so how do we let you become even better? And I think that's that, I think that's that whole idea, Jim, is when we talk about being your authentic self or your whole self, um, that word permission that I mentioned is giving yourself permission to be you. Um, great leaders know they're not great at everything and they will just unapologetically and with humility say, Hey, Jim is way better at, right? So when you and I started Call to Coach years ago, you had ideas on how to do the actual broadcast side of it. I'm like, I'm all, I'm out, Jim, you're in. It's now your, it's now your project. That was after week week one, right? So I'm like, I'll I'll follow your lead. But it's I think it's giving people permission then to fill your gaps to come alongside you and knowing what you're good at, knowing knowing what you're not, and that you don't have to be like anybody else. Well, and I appreciate that, you know, in those early days of doing this, I was, I was really surprised when I came in and I said, I have a better way to do this. And you were literally from the, that moment on, yeah. you were like, okay, it's yours. Maximize like, your you number can... one, maximize your number one, Jim. All you had to say is better. <laughs> you got this. You got this. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, like, wow, go, wow, go. that's, this is pretty great. Yeah. Um, I, I, we live in a world of, of, I, I think as we think of that, about being authentic in our leadership of where we spend some time in this, what I'm going to phrase, and I, I'm going to steal this from Austin in his article, 
about copycat leadership. In other words, we take a leader, we figure out what they what they're doing, and then we try to mimic it or copy it. We yep. try to say, "Oh, I want to be a leader like that," and I think that has some dangers and some pitfalls that are related to this idea of not not being genuine or not being authentic. Yeah. And 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 I it really I see this a lot on LinkedIn where we kind of celebrate and lift up these great leaders. By the way, some of them uh, are crashing down <laughs> as we speak, <laughs> right? Yeah. That, that have been lifted up. And, yeah. and so the, the dangers, what are the dangers? What are also the dangers in this idea of copycat leadership? Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of when we take, like when we talk about quiet quitting, I think it was started as a positive thing of people that were burning themselves out. But what, it, what what's begun to happen with it is the pendulum swung the other way where it's like, do the bare minimum, just, you know, basically check out at work. And we're like, no, 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 no. There needs to be a healthy, like care about my life and my own personal well-being, but give my absolute best every single day. I think the same is true with this idea of copycat leadership. I don't think what Austin uh, was saying or that Gallup would say is, you know, don't model or, or mimic anybody. I think it's fantastic to have role models, mentors, people that you look up to, I think what the best mentors actually do and say when they coach others is they they actually say, let's figure out your talents, your strengths, your approach. Um, the worst, and I've been guilty of this too, is where I just say, all right, Jim, well, here's how I did it. You're not like, for me, I'm low discipline, getting my timesheets done. You know, if my go-to uh, Benjamin is listening to this, he'll know this is real life, real life example after 17 years of Gallup. Um, I found a way to manage that. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't say what you should do is so-and-so on the team that's high discipline every Friday at five o'clock, here's what they do or every day. He knows that that it's not, that would be me trying to copycat somebody else and it might work for a moment, but it's not going to work long-term. And I think too many leaders, they go, I want to be as funny as, or I want to be as, you know, as have all the analytical data, like a Stephen Shields and, you know, who's a Gallup consultant and, phenomenal with throwing out stats. And I'm like, when I first joined this role, even 10 years ago, I was like, oh man, that's what I need to do. And then I realized like, no, he's more of a professor, right? I'm more of the consultant. So how do we just take our own unique approach? There's skills and knowledge that we can learn from each other and from mentors or others that you you can learn from, but giving each other permission to be who you are. Kurt Liesveld, who I know when we started Theme Thursday, um, and Kurt's, you know, contributed so much content to, to Gallup and Gallup coaches that will will live on forever. But again, he would he out of the gates would say, "Hey, when we co-lead something, Jeremy, you open up the session, and then bring me in after a couple hours. You're woo, I'm relater." And it was just him giving me permission, and even mentoring me to say, "Hey, here's some things you can learn from me, um, you know, as a mentor, as a coach." But you be you, I'll be me, and together we're actually better because of that. And there was a lot to be said in that because there were times I would try to say something like somebody else or mimic somebody else that I saw on stage, a Simon Sinek or a Brene Brown or, you know, it's it's you, uh, Dr. Clifton. You, you see these people or these videos and you're like, I need to memorize it and do it that way and step by step. You know, even professional actors, you know, you know when they're a Hallmark actor versus a professional actor. And so... I think that's what gets tricky is people just, you know, the, the detector goes off and they know when you and I aren't being real, whether we're on stage, whether we're behind closed doors, whether it's even verbiage in an email, people that sniff test, they know if you're being true to who you are or trying to pretend and be a copycat, uh, uh, you know, an inauthentic version of somebody else or something else. I've, I've been doing this role long enough that if I try to maintain an image or a set of strengths that I'm not, uh, it would have come out by now, I, yeah. right? I mean, it's yeah. just you just can't sustain it for that long, and nope. and and nope. and so it's it's paid you know it's paid dividends to just continue to be the authentic me, and that so much so I remember Kurt used to you know say Jim, I think you have all thirty four in your top five, because uh, I'd always always say oh it's close, it's close, right? Yeah, uh, from that perspective, and so just some of that authentic, you know, that authentic feedback of. We last year, Jeremy, we released the Clifton Strengths for Manager report. And yep. this year we've released the Clifton Strengths for Leaders report. In your work, as we and I get this question all the time, and I think it pays to probably ask everybody this question. What do you see? How do you see the difference between a manager and a leader? And we know they overlap, but yeah. how do you see the difference? Yeah, so there there's 
there's a Gallup research approach answer to this. So even back, in, and a lot of people know the history of Dr. Clifton, some don't, but he was a professor of psychology, again, was coined the grandfather of positive psychology and then the father of strength-based psychology. So his whole body of work in the 50s and 60s was studying what was right with people. And when he began to study excellence, um, he looked at individual roles, even started a company called Selection Research, helping companies to hire great salespeople or great teachers or great principals and great nurses and doctors. He did the same with people that are in management roles. And by the way, there are people managers and there are project managers. Um, not every project manager. And I was working with an airline that said, we're all engineers. We don't know how to work with people. And I'm like, well, then how did you get <laughs> how did you get to the executive suite? Because your job is to lead people, right? You're not building the airplanes anymore at this level. You're actually leading humans. So part of what I think is really important, even from a research perspective, but just a, a real life tangible perspective, is some of those terms can be interwoven, right? When I'm in an organization, they say, when you say leader, you say manager. So the way I often differentiate it is if we think about every every role in a company essentially has three three buckets it can fall into, which would be leader, manager, or individual contributor. The reality is every individual also plays all three of those roles. So a CEO of a company, the chief executive officer, is the leader. Now, they may have a board of directors and others that they report to, um, but they're a leader. But they also, in every case, I've, I've every organization I've been in, they still have a few direct reports. They're responsible for managing those humans. Even if they go, hey, I'm not a manager, I'm a leader, I'll say, great, you're a big L leader, a little M manager, but you still have both. And then guess what? Even if you have a fantastic executive assistant, you still need to respond to some emails and do some things on your own. So you are still an individual contributor. And I'll often even say to people, I'm like, make a make a little pie chart. And even if I'm an individual contributor, maybe 75% of my pie chart of the my time spent every day, every week, every quarter, maybe 75% of it, I work on the front lines of Ford Motor is individual contributor. But we would still say there's a little M manager, little L leader role that you can play. There's a new person on the front lines. You can sort of lead them, coach them to do that. What I think is interesting with this, and then getting back to the report and the distinction, is when I talk about those three roles, if, if we add three very simple words to them is individual contributors deliver. They get stuff done. So when, when Dr. Clifton was helping hire in the assessments called the professional associate interview, they are people that get results, make stuff happen, very self-motivated, self-driven, um, great thinkers, right? But they, they deliver. For managers, so individual contributors deliver, managers develop. Managers' primary responsibility is to develop other humans, to help them. Again, think about your best manager you ever had. They were somebody that helped you become a better version of yourself, helped you get promoted, helped you get better results. They developed you. And then what leaders do is they direct. So they need to step up to that 30,000 foot view and, and look out and say, here's where we're going. In the midst of the pandemic, um, and you're familiar with our four needs of followers, Jim, of, of, from the book uh, Strength-Based Leadership, where we're talking about big L leadership. And, and by the way, in that book, we highlight four very different leaders, not copycats of each other. They were authentic to who they were. One was more of a relationship builder. One was more of a strategic thinker. Um, small children and family just came into the hotel. It's Welcome. okay. It's, this is hybrid work, Welcome. right? Welcome to Greenville. <laughs> yeah. So um, one, of the, one of the things with that is when you think about that role of leader and, and even in the midst of the pandemic, people were saying, is that leader creating those needs that I need of trust and compassion, stability? Are they giving me that up here? Not just at a local, my manager doing it, or am I providing for myself? But that leadership piece, and again, if we create that a leader is a director and a manager is a developer, when I look at both of those reports, that's what I like. They're, they're, they mimic each other in some ways, uh, for some people, they play both of those roles and both of those reports will help. But the manager report was great at really thinking about how do I come alongside others to develop them, to coach them, uh, to make sure I'm not saying here's how I would do it, but to understand my own strengths and their strengths to actually pull out the best in them. That's all about development. This leader report, I believe, enables leaders to move to that 30,000 foot view and to really think about how am I directing the organization? How am I directing other uh, leaders on my team that, again, oftentimes somebody who's a leader 
has other people leaders under them or other people managers under them, um, or even if you're leading a department or a project, um, it's going to help you to really think about that director perspective. So some of the actions very specific to that, again, my same top 10 strengths that I'm, I'm wanting to leverage and move around like tools in a toolbox. But when I realize self-assurance is my number six, lose my number seven, as a leader, those often pop to the top pretty quickly, along with my futuristic uh, to just help me lead whatever group that I'm in front of at that moment. Mm. Uh, I love it. Good, good. I think just a great example of the difference between the two. Although in my role, I, I move in and out of those all the time. There's Absolutely. oftentimes based yeah. on the community, I need the big hell, big L leader on that. Not as much though, now that I have Austin in that role, um, he's providing more of that than I am. That's okay. We've kind of divided and conquered. I do the more big M managing, managing the community, spending time, yep. boots on the ground, helping people day to day, right? Separating those out. But both reports are very useful to me right? Depending upon kind of knowing when I'm in some, and sometimes I get asked to do leadership responsibilities on the fly. Hey, we need you to think about this, right? And so there's yeah. some opportunities to use both of those. Of course, I use a sales report as well, because I sell things yeah. through this influencing <laughs> role, right? Uh, yeah. uh, we all do. So we, we, parenting. We, I'm like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. That one came out a little bit too late. My kids were, were already high school age. They're like, dad, don't, it's too late. Yeah. yeah, well, we, and we, we've but got all some... Those, yeah, you're right, Jim. All of those different resources that Gallup's written over time and some of these customized reports, I think the same human can use them in different scenarios, but that creates, at least to me, the distinction of which one do I want to look at yeah. In, yeah. in a specific point in time. Yeah. And again, yeah. Dr. Clifton's analogy of great leaders, and he was, again, talking big L leader, what great leaders have in common is not that they have the same strengths, right? I mean, tons of research that Gallup has on that. Uh, but what it is, is that he said, like a carpenter knowing their tools or a physician knowing the instruments at her disposal, they know their strengths that well and can call on the right strength at the right time. And mm -hmm. I think that's that piece of when I'm working with as a manager, people manager, do I need to dial up my relator individualization a little bit more and connect with that human? Yeah. And when I'm or developers, another one of my top 10 when I'm, again, as a leader, is it more of my futuristic, strategic, mm -hmm. self-assurance, woo? And not that I can't use all of those in different scenarios, but it lets me apply my strengths in a more meaningful way to accomplish the what. Uh, one of the things Jacqueline and I have, Jacqueline Robinson and I have yeah, been yeah. doing on Doctor, the recording, Dr. Dr. Robinson, Dr. Dr. Robinson <laughs> uh, on the new uh, season two of the Clifton Strengths podcast yeah, is yeah. putting the two together in a like theme dynamic. So looking at each oh, theme yeah, yeah. and then saying, Here's what we get from the manager report. Here's what we get from the leaders report, and and how do we think about those two together? So, uh, lots of lots of great stuff going on. We just started recording those, and those will release here early January in 2023. What do you see? We alluded to this, Jeremy, a little bit earlier, but what what do you see is the biggest thing that gets in the way of leaders being authentic? We talked about that copycat, but what else gets in the way of of being authentic? Yeah, and, and Jim, you you might know the date on this. If not, we can get it from Austin and share it with others later. But when, whatever year, maybe four or five years ago now, that our Clifton Strength 34 report was revamped and came out, added the colors. One of the things we added, and immediately we got uh, people that loved it, people that hated it, we added something called blind spots. And what people often, and why we wanted to educate people on it, is Dr. Clifton was never afraid to talk about weakness. And even one of the pages in your Clifton Strengths 34 report, it's page 19 in most people's report, actually says, what about weakness? And we just define a weakness as anything that gets in your way or the way of others. What I quickly figured out is it's not my bottom five of harmony, discipline, consistency that actually get in my way that often. It's actually some of my top five, top 10, like futuristic. And this is where I often remind leaders, and Jim, I think I, I find myself saying this a lot because leaders just our leaders are often really good at knowing and they i think we all heard this at some point in our career at an early age like being self-aware is really important right being self-aware is really important what often happens though is clifton strengths whether it's the leader report manager report strengths report clifton strength 34 report it when people know hey i'm high command high activator um that's great you're now self-aware but what the blind spots points out is are those actually your strengths or are they potentially getting in your way? 
which actually we'd, we'd call that a weakness. So I often will remind people that good leaders are self-aware, but great leaders self-regulate, right? So if you want to elevate your game to be an authentic leader and take it up a notch, um, I will, I'll remind people we originally called Clifton Strengths Strength Finder is how it was originally branded. Um, it was Strength Finder, not Excuse Finder. And so when people are like, hey, sorry, I just don't have empathy. I'm command activator. I'm kind of a jerk. Uh, welcome to the team. Now that you know that, Jim, you're going to have to deal. I, sometimes I'm a, I'm a bull in a china shop. Okay, awesome. He's aware he's a bull in a china shop. But guess what? I have the ability. And again, when Dr. Clifton said like tools in a toolbox, I have some other strengths. If I'm being an authentic leader, my authentic self, the best version of myself, there's something else there I can dial up. So Brian Brim, Dr. Brian Brim, who's one of our, our authors and and uh, consultants, coaches. He actually tells a story about an executive he was coaching. The guy's name was Terry, and his team nicknamed him Takeover Meeting Terry. And he was that guy, command activator, communication achiever, like, let's go. And he loved, he knew they nicknamed him Takeover, Takeover Meeting Terry. And so he would just be like, guess who's here, guys? Takeover Meeting Terry. <laughs> like, whatever you were talking about, doesn't matter. He realized, though, that he was actually getting in his own way because his team stopped sharing ideas. Their engagement actually dipped a little bit. They didn't feel cared about. They didn't feel like their opinions counted. Um, and and so one of the things that he, that our, our buddy Brian, uh, Brian Brim coached him to do is he said, hey, what if you dialed down blind spot of command, right? You're just taking over the meeting. What if you dialed that down? And then Terry also had learner and input in his top 10. So he said, what if for the first five minutes of the meeting, because you're an activator, you want to get going. What if you ask three questions before you interject it? And so Terry actually went to his next executive meeting, said to his team, hey, guys, I'm going to I'm going to dial and use Gallup language. I'm going to I realize my command's getting in the way. So he's aware of it. But now he's actually regulating it. The blind spot actually even told him that sometimes you might be a bully. Right. Um, so he actually said, I'm going to ask three questions before I before I jump in. Now, one of his one of the exec, exec team members was bold enough to push back to him. And he actually said, hey, Terry, what happens when you don't ask three questions? Because you're the boss. So and Terry actually gave himself some accountability. He said, uh, if I don't, I'll, I'll leave the meeting like you guys boot me out of the room. And so I was actually traveling with Brian and um, he gets a phone call on his on his cell phone and uh, He's laughing and he, he gets off. He goes, that was Terry. He was calling me from the hallway outside of the boardroom. And I said, why was he laughing? He goes, because he made it two weeks before he got kicked out. So he actually, <laughs> but I think that's, and again, that was Terry being a better version of himself, being more authentic. I think what he realized is what was getting in his way were his quote unquote strengths, his dominant talents and the blind spots of those. And even though he was aware, you're like, if you're aware of it, then then adjust it. If I'm, if I'm analytical and I'm always looking at you with that, you know, kind of resting serious face or whatever it's been nicknamed, right? It's kind of, uh, but if I'm always looking at you like this, I'm like, there's maybe something else in my top 10. I can dial down the interrogation and dial up my relator and connect with the human for a few minutes before I get back into the question asking. I want to talk a little bit about move away from a little bit of blind spots and, and weaknesses and talk a little bit of how we use this report for success. I think, you know, I, I talk a lot. I always got, um, I always got hammered for talking all the time. People would always say, <laughs> oh, right? yeah. here's Jim, he's going to take over the conversation. And I think one of those things for me that was really helpful was continuing to put myself in, instead of dialing it down, figure out ways to find roles and responsibilities that honored that you hosted a podcast exactly <laughs> right i mean how great is that yeah. yeah how great is that right so so for me uh appointing some of my roles and responsibilities and looking that didn't happen overnight but pointing myself in some of those directions that honored those in fact for me i need to dial it up even more it's not about dialing it down but dial up this communication and woo even more how else can we use this report you think to be authentic yeah so the the thing i love about all of gallup's writings on strengths um and again i think sometimes people push back and they're like but what about weaknesses or what about this again gallup would say if there's something getting in your way or in the way of others manage it so if my low discipline is getting in my way um, if my high futuristic, if I keep derailing meetings with ideas instead of listening to others, that's where I need to pause. Um, or if others are disrupting me, right? <laughs> like, 
I own this hotel. It's all it's all good. Please, it's please. all good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> please ask permission before you walk <laughs> into the lobby. Uh, the uh, my, that's my low focus, Jim. I'm being authentic with you. I'm like, I can't, I can't not see the bird in the window. No worries. Yeah. So part of part of what is interesting with again all of our content and wanting people to say, okay, we want you to manage the weakness, but when you focus on strengths. The thing I love about it is, again, coming back to being your authentic self, who you are, giving yourself permission to be you, for you to be like, you're somebody that maybe your fifth grade school teacher said talks too much, lock him in a room by himself. What you probably had happen at some point is a teacher that partnered you up with somebody else or in a group activity, let you talk, but in a productive way. Or Jim, you're my assistant today, right? So they were finding a way for you to leverage your communication talent in a way where it actually let you be our authentic self. This is where throughout most Gallup reports or in our team sessions, you'll often see the words understand and appreciate. So do I understand somebody with responsibility and what that means, right? That they want to take ownership for things and they don't want me to micromanage them or check in with them. The other thing though is do I appreciate it? So under, when I understand it, do I genuinely appreciate it? And again, whether it's one of my own strengths um, or especially when I'm with people, uh, my exec assistant has three of my bottom five and her top five. So do I understand her discipline, even though it's low for me, do I understand it? Okay. She has a need for structure. So instead of me trying to loosen her up or her trying to make me more disciplined, do we actually say, okay, I actually appreciate that. That actually makes me better when it comes to my calendar or flights and other, other, you know, expenses and things that have a very regimented routine to them the more I actually appreciate her for that and understand it. And I say, Hey, I'm not wired that way, but you are, or I understand my own self and who I am and, and appreciate that. I think that's one of the things that again, this leadership report, but even knowing a leader, knowing thyself, knowing your strengths. Um, and then the other thing, I think when we begin to listen for understanding, uh, you've maybe heard that. I know Jim, you've been married a long time. I have too. And the number of times, even from my wife, or there's books written on it, um, she goes, you're not listening to me. And I'm like, no, you said, right? And I try to play it back. I've even learned to, you know, one of one of the Gallup 12 elements of engagement says, you know, great cultures and great managers uh, that are coaches seem to care. You're like my manager or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. And I often joke because I'll say for those of us with low empathy and low relationship building strengths, it doesn't even say we care, it just says we seem to care. <laughs> so I'm like, I'll, I've learned to look at my wife and be quiet and listen and nod. And then she'll say, what did I say? And I'll be like, I don't know. I was trying to just not, <laughs> not interject. But when you truly understand somebody, when you even begin to practice that mirroring activity that great listeners do, hey, Jim, so wait, when you were saying that last week was tough, because oh, did I catch that right? No, no, no. What I actually meant when I said tough is, oh, okay. But when we listen to understand, that's totally different than listening for agreement. And I think what authentic leaders do, and even when I say leader, if sometimes I'll even do this intentionally, if you look at the direction my hand's going, I'll say leader, manager, individual contributor. Because I think great leaders are servant leaders that lift up those who are managing the front lines and those managers lift up people on the front lines to say, we can't get it done without you. It's not do what I say, leading through guilt, fear, shame. It's leading through that servant leadership approach. And when you begin to become a leader that wants to genuinely understand others, understand their strengths, appreciate their strengths, you want to listen to understand them, it's a game changer. And this, by the way, I have self-assurance and belief. So sometimes I'll listen and, uh, you know, Matt Mosser, our, our chief people officer at Gallup says, sometimes even though he's worked for Gallup his entire career, he's like, I'm sometimes listening with the engine of my brain revving in the background. Like, Jim, you done yet? You done yet? It's my turn. It's my turn, <laughs> right? Oh, I know your cues. I'm like, when, Jim, when Jim's done listening to me, he'll move to the mic. And I'm like, all right, give him space and red light, green light. But one of the things that when we can turn off that engine revving, like my turn, my turn, my turn, when we truly begin to understand somebody, and I often will say dial up your curiosity, and maybe it's your learner that you have in your top 10 or your input, or for me, my maximizer, What I, I got to keep digging for that gem. When we dial up our curiosity, it, it's a game changer for genuinely understanding those that you're working with. Yeah, it's been a good, in this role, it's been good for me to have the listening responsibilities. 
Yeah. And I think I've actually gotten better at it over practice of yeah. moving the mic away, not interrupting, <laughs> letting the thought get all the way through. That's changed me some in now conversations that I'm having with other people yeah. where I'm kind of listening for, for clues of things they're saying. Yeah, I want to respond back to them, but no, I don't want to respond from my standpoint. I want to respond from theirs. What did I hear? In some? And I'm not perfect. But I'm getting better. No, I, season one, Jim, and I, I, I'm not a guy who loves to go back and watch and listen to myself. <laughs> I mean, I've, I, I've done that occasionally, and there's things to learn, but I'm like, oh, man, just hearing your own voice, right? Um, but there's moments where you can tell, like, I, I'm just – I'm looking at the questions over here that we gave the person and just waiting for them to be done. I'm like, awesome. So when you – and <laughs> I didn't absorb what they said. I didn't take it in. Again, and a lot of our coaches know this. But there's some great content if you just Google the levels of listening, um, where most of us sitting on an airplane or, you know, you're kind of level one listening. When you get to that level three, and I think Jackie Merritt's talked about it on some different um, Call to Coach or Theme Thursdays or, or different podcasts we've done. But when you genuinely, and again, as an authentic leader, I think when you begin to say, hey, I want to hear from you all first. I was actually on site with Google um, not too long ago. And they had a brand new leader and she didn't say anything. It, we went around the room, people were talking and I'm like, she hasn't chimed in at all. I'm like, man, I don't know if I need to coach her. She's so introverted. Like, and then she went last and she actually said, Hey guys, I know I'm new to Google, but one of the things I learned very quickly is leaders speak last. And so I've been listening to you and here's some things I've heard. And it was phenomenal. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, she was intentionally doing what you said kind of I'm dialing up my listening. Now, it doesn't have to be awkward. It doesn't have to be like, why aren't they talking? If you or I were just like, <laughs> you know, people are like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Is your mic not working? But I think that's the piece that when you begin to, to be present with the human, and again, my belief, self-assurance, I have an agenda sometimes, or I have, this is what I'm listening for. Or I need to convince them. And when I think about um, the people who, who most easily follow me or listen to me or take my advice, I was just coaching a CEO yesterday. And when I asked enough questions to really understand, I said, wait, let me go back to something you said earlier. When I genuinely understood and he felt heard, that was the moment where he said, yeah, so what would you, what do you recommend on that? Right. And it was one of those moments where I had to move from coach to advisor and I shared some thoughts and best practices. Um, and then I said, tell me what you're hearing from what I just threw at you. But I think that genuinely understanding piece, it's just, it's a game changer. Yeah. No. It, yeah, one of the things I've tried doing is going into meetings and not talking at all until I'm called upon. Yeah. Right? Just yeah. sit quietly in and, and it's, it, you know, again, it's, and I don't, I don't know if I'd say I'm dialing it back. I'm just intentionally knowing like, okay, like I'm going to let this thing roll. And when they're ready to hear from me, they'll ask. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's, it's so much better for me. It's even worked better. I now, I now like it more. I used to, you know, I used to really kind of like my engine would stutter yeah, as yeah. I was, you know, well, trying to communicate communication, move positivity, right. Are all three yeah. in your top 10. Yeah. What, yes. yeah. In, let me ask you this, Jim, like in that moment, cause I think that's the early on piece is we're like, you're like holding back this, this race horse. Right. And you're like, but I just want to talk. I just, but when, when you look at your toolbox and you go, wait, Jim, you don't have three strengths, man. You've got, you've got 10 or 12 yeah. you can pull from when and again i think you've become a phenomenal host to to our podcast a lot of other components of just who you are what you do which of your other strengths do you feel like you're using because i think that's part of being an authentic leader mm -hmm. when you're like i can't mm -hmm. be myself we're like no no no. you've got other right so what other strengths do you use when you're patiently listening yeah six through ten are all relationship building so yeah. individualization developer, right? Those are two that I lean on all the time to think, okay, I'm going to dive in deep. And in the midst of this conversation, how can I individualize what you're saying, play it back to you. So not only I can be developed, but you can as well in the midst yep. of the conversation, right? Yeah. It's that allows me those, if I'm thinking with that intent of, you know, making this the best interview I can for you, I'm doing that right now, right? You know, and how can we do it in a way that develops others, develops you as well as others? Yeah. Um, boy, that's a win, right? And so that for me, those are two. I don't talk about those very often. <laughs> yeah. But those are two that I've used. And most the most people around me don't talk about those very yeah. often. But it, 
it's the two I try to use the most, or I've maybe gotten better at of dialing those up. Uh, yeah, there's a the chief legal of officer. She she has a couple like you. She has a couple of those relationship building strengths in her top ten, and in their office and like a lot of our clients, they'll put top five on email. She goes, don't tell people I have these because these are my ninja skills. Because she's she you know she works in legal and she sits in these tough meetings where her achiever, you know, she's got, she's got a little bit of self assurance. So she's like, yeah. I've got that just just rip off the bandaid approach, but she has empathy. She has relator. She, and I'm, I'm like, and she knows it. Um, but even for her as a woman in a senior leadership role, she was often taught, don't be too soft. Don't be, mm -hmm. but when she finds ways to inject that it's, it's crazy how much influence and impact she has by being again, an authentic leader, her authentic self. This is where I think Jim, when people often execs will say, but empathy is 34 or woo is 34, whatever it is, futuristic is like, how do I do more of that? And again, we teach this in basic strengths 101, where like, if you combine two of your top 10, it can look like something else, right? So somebody with learner and relator can go to an event and connect with humans and it can look like woo, right? They're just talking to people in smaller groups and asking a lot of questions. And they may end up working the entire room that night because they're like, oh, there's people over there I haven't talked to yet. So that that practice of knowing your top 10, like you said, just dialing some things down, dialing some things up early on. I think it feels like you're not letting me be myself or 360s are to saying or your fifth grade school teacher said, Jeremy, Jim, you guys are talking too much. You know, they're sending a note home to mom or dad. So the reality is we probably were talking too much in those moments. So dialing it down and then the other cool thing and i just just this is just a note for you jim with like for people out there with communication communication is equally list it's it's listening and it's immensely nonverbal. so your positivity woo communication are actually being leveraged right now when, when you're doing this and you're smiling at me and give me that, oh yeah that was great but when it's authentic right because again other people will do this yeah. Yeah. and they're not even really listening you can actually see and i'll sometimes say what are you thinking about? Right. My wife's really good at that. She's like, where did you go? Tell, share your futuristic <laughs> with me. Is it sunny there? Tell us what you're, and she'll just, she'll know when I'm, like, I'm looking at her, but I'm like thinking about something. Oh, that's so. so great. I, I also have relator in my top 10. And so that plays a big part in this of yeah. thinking about what's going on. You know, it sounds like includer in this case, but getting everybody like, wanting to know that everybody knows what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Spending time yeah. together. We do have some great questions from the chat. Let's yeah. let's spend a little time doing yeah, that. So, so Ooh, uh, Brooks says, feature. what, okay. yeah, this is new since I've had you on <laughs> nine and a half years yeah. ago. What are your thoughts on having people dial back their strengths or finding roles and responsibilities where they can dial them up, dial up their strengths if they're in the same position as others? So we, Think about, you know, maybe an engineering role like you were talking about where maybe some roles and responsibilities are the same for everyone. But we come at it from a different perspective. You know, everybody's a, a little bit different in this. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah. So one of the one of the strategies for managing a weakness, and this is in all those re reports, um, especially the Clifton Strength 34 report, I mentioned page 19 says, what about weakness? Um, one of the strategies actually talks about like, just again, owning who you are. So claiming, claiming your strengths, good and bad. But to Brooke's point, if it's, if it's in a role where like, Hey Jim, you're not paid to talk, man. You're, it might be a moment where you're like, okay, Jim Collins says, get the right people on the bus, but then also get them in the right seat on the bus. There are people all over the world and people who I talk to almost every day, um, who started their career in a different job than they're in today. And sometimes it was a job that they liked part of it, but not all of it. And by all of it, it's not, you're not gonna love everything you do all day, every day. But one of the engagement questions Gallup asks is, do I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day? Doesn't say all day, every day, but every day, do I get to use a little futuristic or self-assurance or woo or belief? Um, so I, I do think to Brooke's point, if I'm positioned in a job, what I quote unquote get paid to do, or even in my free time, where I'm dialing more of my strengths up. And when I think about my collective top 10, um, that's obviously when people are happiest and healthiest. And I say healthiest because when we're playing to our non-strengths, I'll even sometimes say to somebody, look at your bottom five strengths. Uh, imagine I'm your new boss and I just rewrote your job description and it demands your bottom five strengths. 
And then I'll pause and say, tell me how you feel about that. Right. And people will be like, uh, do I have to do it? Or I'm putting my resume together as we speak. You know, it's not that you can't do those things that are bottom five, but if you're in a, you're in a job where you're constantly can't be who you are and your authentic self played your strengths, a, it may not be the right fit for you when we're in a job though. And Brooke kind of what I like, again, that dial up, dial down, I use that language a ton because I stole it from my coach, uh, Rosa de Koning, uh, 17 years ago. And I joined Gallup, which she was coaching me. Uh, we were both, both based in our Cleveland, Ohio office. And she said about 20 minutes into coaching, she said, Jeremy, real quick, uh, when you're grilling on your backyard grill, uh, do you keep the knobs on high the whole time? And I sort of paused. I'm like, is it almost lunchtime? I don't live anywhere near here. I don't know why she's asking about cooking, but I, I entertained her question, which I realized later she was coaching me. Um, I said, no, Rosa, sometimes you got to dial one down and dial one up, which she already knew that, right? She goes, your strengths are the same way. Um, your maximizer, you can use it in your role, but when you're nitpicking, criticizing everything or everybody, it's going to be exhausting for people and exhausting for you. So maybe dial that down and dial your woo up and make things a little bit more fun. So I think that's the beauty of authentic leaders are constantly, and Jim, you said this, it's almost like, am I leading? Am I managing? You're like, well, I, I'm doing some of both in this meeting or individual contributing. I need to be the note taker. I'm going to be the one at the whiteboard. Um, so I think that's where, you know, life is fluid. And even when we begin to think about work-life integration, um, I'll sit with the CEO who will say, hold on a minute, my kid's calling. And I'm like, awesome. Talk to your, like, I'm not mad at them. I'm like, talk to your kid. Right. Um, uh, now if the kid calls again, five minutes later, and five minutes later, we're like, all right, let's get out the strength-based parenting book and, and <laughs> help them, help them help their kid. But the reality is, Dialing up, dialing down is a great strategy. And to Brooke's point, if I'm in a job where I'm dialing to feeling like everything needs to be dialed down, it may not be the right fit. Um, but that little adjustment of strengths is oftentimes the number one way that people aim their strengths to be most successful. Uh, Jess asked a question that's very similar. Um, she says, how would you suggest you coach people to dial up their talents in the workplace when perhaps their roles and responsibility call for other skills? And I was thinking about I yeah. was driving home. We we went out. Uh, Micah was speaking across the state, and we drove yeah, out yeah. to see her. Yeah, yeah. On the way back, she really sparked some 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 ideas in my head on some things. Uh, my wife was there with me as we were listening oh, cool. to Micah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Sarah is taking like pages and pages and pages <laughs> of notes. She's a note taker, right? I come back with like a half a page and three cryptic sentences on it. But as we were driving back, you know, both of us struggle with budgeting and spending and it's been a, it's been a, a topic, our whole marriage. Yeah. And, and it's on the way back, uh, I had this thought, I'm like, I, I said to her, what if we did a strengths-based approach to this? How do we change our budgeting in a way that plays to each other's strengths? How yeah. can, how can we do some things when you're doing, when you're spending, how can you do that in a way that fits the model that makes me comfortable with it and vice versa. Right. Yeah. And so I think sometimes if we can apply that to the workplace to say, Okay, I don't have those skills. In this case, yeah. you know, we think the skills are the the things we actually have to do, right? Talents is the way we get them done. Yeah. But they, and they blend. They kind of blend together a little bit. But if I think I don't have that, we'll change the rules. Like yeah. like okay, <laughs> how do we do this if we think about it from a strengths-based approach? How would we change the rules to make it fit the the what we currently have? In other words, yeah. Let's change this so that it plays to my strengths and it plays to your strengths. Thoughts on that, Jeremy? Yeah, I, I mean, A, I commend you. I think the more we practice stuff in real time um, with the people that are closest to us, so you and your wife having a real life conversation, right? Um, that, that, and I like the, I like the question because, and, and even the word skills that you just came back to, Jim, or like budgeting. Um, there are things that I, I simply call it the what versus the how. So I can't go, ah, I'm just low discipline, low consistency, low analytical. So I guess I'm just not a good budgeter, Jim. I just don't do that. Again, that to me is excuse finder, not strength finder. Right. Um, so A, in any, in any job, um, we all have a certain what. So if, if Jim and I are in the exact same job, um, we are both paid to do the same what. And G Gallup would help us ask, can that person do it, right? Do they have a high likelihood to do the job? What Clifton Strengths then tells us is how we do it. So even with your strong relationship building strengths, Jim, and your influencing strengths, are you doing it sort of with and for other people? 
uh, with some of my influencing, but then strategic thinking, do I need a little bit of that whiteboard space and some thought partners? And so if we can both get the same thing done, the role responsibility skill, then so what? And this is where some of you, you can play around with this. Um, if you're not all familiar with Gallup's research around, we call it competencies 2.0, but we actually talk about some of the, the great qualities of both a great leader, manager, individual contributor, but it's things like decision-making. I could, I could help somebody who has zero, uh, you know, of dominant strengths in their top 10. If they have zero themes that are green strategic thinking, but yet they still need to be a good decision maker. I can still help them to do that. Right. We could look at high responsibility and say, okay, um, if you have a responsibility to make decisions in a certain time frame and, and decisions that have good outcomes and aren't, aren't financially, uh, you know, problematic for the department or the company, that person all of a sudden is sort of woken up to say, well, I got to figure out how I do that or who I can partner with to give me that information. So this is where when we define the what and even the skill I need to learn, relationship building is another one of those competencies. Um, I'm working with a CEO for a financial advising company. Uh, a, he's, he's based in London and he and his team all know because we did a team strength session. They all went through Gallup's two day boss to coach manager training um, together. Uh, his whole team knows he has zero relationship building in his in his top 10. Um, I think his first one pops up at like 16. Uh, they also know empathy is <laughs> so he started out sort of excuse finder. Well, Jeremy, good thing is they know I'm intense and I'm intense at work and he's he's a cyclist for fun. Um, but what he did. So he and I had a conversation. He said, I need to get better at, quote unquote, role skill um, as a leader relationship building. And I need to at least express that people know I seem to care. And so what we did, and he came up with the strategy, I said, when you have a to-do list, what happens? He goes, oh, it gets done. And I said, tell me where your to-do list show up. So he's got them electronically. He also said, I use post-it notes, something I got to get done this week. It goes on the, my mod, hangs off the monitor in my screen. And I said, okay, what about this? What if you wrote the initials of every, every one of your direct reports? And one of the, one of the things we know for relationship building that great managers do is they have one meaningful touch point with each person they lead each week. Again, that could be a text message, it could be a voicemail, it could be a pop my head into their office if I'm if I work in the same location. Um, he admitted, he goes, Jeremy, the people that work in this office in London, I I will do that. You know, he's, he's got a little bit of woo, so that's one of his influencing strengths. And he's like, I'll pop in and ask them how they're doing. But he said, one of my colleagues, uh, you know, in Amia, he's like, I maybe once a month. So he used his, his achiever, which is a purple executing strength, to build relationships. And all he did is put people's initials. And he said, by Friday, if I hadn't talked to Jim Collison, I'm picking up the phone and going, hey, Jim. And they know. They go, hey, am I the last one to check off the list? It's, you know, <laughs> but what his whole team said, it's, it's made him more intentional. It's made him more available. And he genuinely seems to care about us more. And I actually feel like I've gotten to know him more over the last four months that he's been doing that. He's dialing up a totally different color totally, to build a skill. Um, and again, the skill of relationship building in that case, he's using his own strengths, dialing those up to accomplish that. Yeah. Sometimes I wish we hadn't done domains because they get in the way of like we get. Sheer, sheer curtains, not walls. You right. got you to gotta be like membranes, a different color. Yeah. It's yeah. A, yeah. I don't have that. Yeah. yeah. No, I think sometimes uh, without coaching that can get in the way of some totally. things and. People like, oh, I don't know. You do. Let's work through that. Yeah. Oh, I'm coaching. not smart. And I'm like, really? How did you just string that sentence together? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One more question from Pam, and then we'll wrap it. She says, I'm curious. Do you think there's a correlation between authenticity and confidence? I think I heard mm. Jeremy say self-assurance is, is number six or seven, and his authenticity shines through this idea correlation between authenticity and confidence. Jeremy, what yeah. do you think? Yeah. Uh, Pam, thank you, by the way. Um so the, uh, I actually had, do you early... feel heard, Jeremy? Yeah. Do you feel heard? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Self-assurance. I, by the way, when I first saw it there, I sort of liked, I'm like, it's one of those that whatever the data point is, Jim, I think 7% of people have in their top five, right? So self-assurance command, some of those that don't show up as often, sometimes than they do, they tend to have more edge than, um, but I think when somebody gave me, I'm going to go back to that word permission. When somebody gave me permission to say, hey, where is that for you? Um, you don't have to apologize as much. You don't have, like, like Just be confident, but also be kind. And I think that's where, again, uh, Kurt Leesville used to say, when we take a we perspective versus a me perspective. 
So somebody with competition, if it's an I need to win, right, all about me, it's going to have more of that edge. If it's a we need to win or I want to help us win, um, all of a sudden people want it. It's more attractive. People want to be a part of it. So I, I'm a firm believer that um, confidence um, and, and comfort, I'm a comfortable being myself. When I'm comfortable being myself, I'm more confident. When I'm more confident, I'm more comfortable being myself. So even things like wear your favorite outfit when you go on stage, or you're going in front of a client, right? Um, some of you are like, man, I don't, you know, whatever, whatever that I'm like, when you are, when you are comfortable, even just physically comfortable, um, you can tell when people are uncomfortable and they're like, and it's hard to listen to them because their nonverbals are screaming. They don't want to be on stage. They don't be, I was doing a live call yesterday for a client and, uh, 1400 people were going to be live on the call and the CHRO and I were doing this fireside chat. And then she said to the gal who leads their engagement culture endeavor, she goes, Hey, if there's a question, I'm just going to kick it to you quick. Are you cool with that? And you saw that like immediately you saw her go, like, you want me to speak? To, and we are, this is pre-show, right? She's like, you want me to speak? And I go, Hey, what if she just, ta- what if she just types it in the chat and you could see like, she just became comfortable because she's like, I'm not, she was even like, did I even fix my hair? I didn't even know I was going to be on camera. <laughs> like, But the more we make sure people are comfortable, and I, I think, Pam, one of the number one ways to be comfortable is know your strengths, give yourself permission to be you. Um, again, when you understand, appreciate others, when you laugh at yourself and go, wait, this is my learner. I just bought all of you, all of you a book thinking you all love to read. And I know you don't. If you read any of it, read chapter five. Um, or if you're not a reader, you want the audio audio book, you know, or you want the TED talk. Um, when we begin to just again own who we are and who we're not, we're we're comfortable, we're confident, and again, I think people know it. They they know we're not ha- trying to be the hallmark actor right now, um, who's pretending awkwardly that. By the way, we still watch. <laughs> my wife and I were just watching one of those last night. You're like, we still watch it, but we know how it's going to end. But be your true self. I think it, your confidence. And your comfortability will shine through and people will want what you have. I, I for 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 me, authenticity comes with a combination of both. If I'm too confident, I come across a little too like I need an edge. I need a chip on my shoulder. I need to be I need something, you know, that that that's kind of holding me accountable. And and yeah. if I if I'm just confident, I, I always I get too I get too confident. And then I end up missing things. Call it cautious confidence. I I would think a brain surgeon, you don't want one that's like, I don't know. You also don't want no one that's just like, give me the patient. I do no wrong. Cautious comp, like you're just, you're you're being mindful of of it. But yeah, that's great. Jeremy, I think nine and a half years ago, you, I, and Kurt Liesfeld got to spend a bunch of time together as we launched this and eventually would launch Theme Thursday and we spent a bunch of time together. My favorite moments from those days were we'd often get done with the webcast and because we all were here in Omaha, we'd meet in the in the atrium for lunch together yeah, and, and talk about what we talked about. But it was a learning opportunity time for me to learn from both you and Kurt during those days and with just some great coaching. So I'll say thank you for those as we get, you know, as we fast forward nine years later. Yeah. And think about all the inspiration that you gave to me that I could then give to the community. And so thanks well, for you're, being you're a welcome, big part. Jim, but also yeah. thank you because you were the one who was your curiosity in those moments. You were asking Kurt and I questions that maybe we knew the answers to, but we at least together kind of kind of just dialogue through it. And yeah. again, it turned into 10 years of conversation with live audiences or recorded audiences where they hopefully walk away with some nuggets as well. Yeah. So thank you, Jer- man. Yeah. You, you bet, Jeremy. I literally knew nothing when we started this. <laughs> like I knew I could do it. I could do the podcasting bit. I didn't know the info and, and I, you know, I'd been an IT manager. I, I wasn't in this, into the strengths world. I mean, I was, but yeah. not from a learning standpoint. You had lived it, but you hadn't, yeah, you hadn't learned it. I hadn't it learned it. And taught yeah. It. I hadn't learned yeah. it. And so 10 yeah. years of learning. Thanks for, inspiring me and saying yes that day and it's it's we're doing this because you said yes yeah and uh and so i, I still remember my door you. was closed i still remember you coming down, the, down looking in my glass yeah. wall and i'm like come on in. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah no it's it's great so i appreciate you and appreciate your uh, your willingness to believe and uh yeah. and with that high belief to believe we could get it done 
uh, thanks for coming out today. Hang tight for me one second. And yeah, uh, hey, chat room, show your appreciation in the chat room, Jeremy, if you would, uh, for me. And while we do that, I'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we do have available now in Gallup Access that we didn't have nine and a half years ago. Gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths for coaching, master coaching, or if you want to become a Gallup certified strengths coach, send us an email coaching at gallup.com if you want to stay up to date with all the events that we do live you can follow us gallup.eventbrite b-r-i-t-e gallup.eventbrite.com uh, don't forget to you can join us for the 2023 gallup at work summit details are now available some of them will be releasing them as we go gallup at work all one word gallup at work.com find us on any social platform just by searching clifton strengths and we want to thank you for joining us today if you found it helpful, and I know you did because I've been reading your comments in the chat, and it says that. So share it, would you? Take the link, share it with somebody, and uh, and maybe maybe it'll brighten their day a little bit as well. Thanks for coming out. For those listening live, with that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>